All right, let's get going. So the we've been talking about uh, various data warehousing techniques uh, as a, sort of the accumulation, uh, the culmination of uh, of our work on parallel databases. And well, we, we kind of talked about a couple of, of techniques for data warehousing, uh, but even those are not necessarily guaranteed to allow you to zip through a couple of uh, hundred petabytes of, of data. So uh, one strategy we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be talking today about a couple of strategies uh, that allow us to very efficiently go through very large amounts of data if we're willing to sacrifice something in terms of how accurate the results that we get are. Um, now unfortunately the textbook doesn't do a particularly good job of covering this. Uh, so I've posted a couple of supplemental uh, reading materials on Piazza, uh, a couple of academic papers. Uh, I'll be trying to keep uh, to, to give as faithful a rendition of, of the paper's contents in these, these lectures. Uh, so hypothetically, you shouldn't actually need to go through those, although they're actually fairly well written, most of them. Um, in particular, the ones that I'm going to post tonight uh, on online aggregation. Quite well written. Um, so, basically, use, use those for reference. Um, I'm happy to answer questions on Piazza as well. Um, the TH should also be uh, able to answer any questions that you have. So, uh, with that, uh, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the any, I'll be checking to see who submitted tonight and running the first set of time trials. Uh, hopefully, I'll have the results posted by Friday so that you have uh, some baseline to go for. Uh, for the Sunday trial, uh, but either way. Um, I'll also hopefully have the Project 2 grades out by then. Um, fingers crossed. And finally, uh, homework due as a brief reminder. Uh, homework 7 is due on Monday. Uh, also, one other thing I wanted to cover. Um, there were a bunch of questions about uh, window queries. So I just wanted to give sort of a, a high level uh, insight into how uh, the the impression I got was that people weren't quite grasping the intuition for the, the window queries. So just to give people a, a more concrete idea, let's say you have a set of data values. Uh, a window query is going to give you an ag not just one aggregate value, but actually a sequence of aggregate values. So it's going to uh, you're going to have a sliding window that has a concrete beginning and end in this stream. And that window is going to start out by giving you a sum for the first element. And then we're going to basically just slide the window along to produce more aggregates. So the first aggregate we get has, uh, counts just the first tuple. The second aggregate we get counts just the second tuple. Uh, the third aggregate we get counts uh, the first three. And now the window's end reaches the beginning of the stream. So we're just going to slide along the stream and get three tuples at a time. Uh, and for every set of three adjacent tuples, we're going to produce one aggregate value. Um, are there any questions about that? Or th does everyone sort of get the intuition behind that? This is also known as a sliding window join for obvious reasons. Uh, and uh, because it wasn't necessarily quite clear, uh, the, the window definition uh, basically has both a uh, a sort order defined over it, namely, in this case, uh, we're sorting over the month field. Um, and the interval, which defines basically how wide that window is, how many tuples fit into that window. Uh, so in this case, the interval is defined as one month. In this case, uh, month being a keyword representing one month of time. Uh, so the, the interval is from uh, one month before a given tuple uh, to one month after a given tuple. And every tuple defines one window. Uh, note, by the way, that this uh, it's possible for the tuple to have a variable number of tuples in it. Uh, so in this case, because the, the interval is defined in terms of time, um, the, the size of the window can vary if there are uh, a lot of tuples that appear in one month and very few tuples that appear in another. Is that clear? All right. I know it's raining, but come on, we'll, we'll, we'll enthusiasm here. This is databases. All right. So to recap, um, we were talking about data warehouses. Data warehouses store very large amounts of data. And the workloads uh, are basically centered around 
uh, lots of reads, lots of reads that have to be evaluated very, very quickly. And a lot of those are going to involve uh, summarization techniques, uh, predominantly aggregation. Uh, so something to keep in mind uh, is, or something that, that we can exploit in order to provide that low latency is that in general, you don't necessarily need an exact answer. Um, if you're talking about uh, millions of orders and you want to know, uh, you know how, maybe 10% of those orders are, are uh, fall into your selection predicate, it doesn't necessarily matter if it's 10.001% uh, uh, that you get back as an answer or 10 point, basically if you get back uh, something that is within maybe two orders, uh, within an order of magnitude of the right answer, usually that's enough for, uh, for answering your question. And so uh, what we're going to talk about today, probably Friday, maybe it'll extend on into Monday, but basically the, what we're going to talk about in the next couple of lectures is uh, techniques that give us uh, much better latency uh, in exchange for uh, precision. So if we're willing to take a hit on precision, uh, we can get much better query performance. And these techniques fall into two general categories. The first, uh, we've already encountered a little bit of this, uh, the first is to create a sketch of the data set, to, to create some sort of very small summary that can be very efficiently computed, and that allows us to get an approximate answer uh, to some aggregate uh, query. So we've already encountered this uh, with the bloom filters. So you can think of that as, as sort of a sketch of a data set that tells you, that allows you to answer set containment questions uh, with some probability. Uh, today we're going to be talking uh, first about count, the count distinct sketch. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, something uh, called a, a count sketch. Hopefully we'll have enough time today. Um, if not, that'll be Friday. And then the next thing we're going to talk about is a set of techniques involving um, sampling and in particular uh, techniques uh, that fall into a, a category called online aggregation. And the idea here is that you don't, get, um, you don't get a precise answer right away, you get an approximate answer. And as the query sits there, it keeps computing. So as, as there's a, uh, you're getting immediate feedback. Uh, you, you first issue the query, you get a, a, an answer that is maybe two orders of magnitude off. Uh, but then as you sit there, the, the query basically gets uh, progressively and, uh, more and more accurate. Um, and as soon as it's accurate enough, you can stop it. Um, right, and so we're going to talk about a couple of things related to that. Uh, any questions on the general motivation? Does, is it sort of clear that uh, you, you want this sort of trade, uh, that it's, it's useful to have a trade-off between latency and uh, latency and uh, accuracy. Yeah, precision means accuracy. Yeah, uh, precision accuracy. Yeah, the how how uh, reliable the query results are? Are they within one order of magnitude? Uh, are they within ten uh, ten percent, five percent, that kind of thing? Okay, so we've as I said, we've already encountered um, we've already encountered one form of sketch. A bloom filter is essentially one of one of these sketches. Um, Next, we're going to talk about a couple of, of different um, techniques for uh, sketching targeted at, uh, at providing an efficient answers uh, to aggregate queries. So the, the first of these uh, deals with count distinct. Now, just regular count is, is something that's very easily parallelizable, and you can break it up. Uh, you just need to count individual subsets. Usually, it doesn't even hurt to, to keep track of, of a count for an entire set. Uh, basically, count, just regular count, is easy. Uh, count distinct, on the other hand, in order to get uh, a correct, a completely correct answer for a count distinct query, uh, where you're returning uh, one, uh, the count is only incremented once for every distinct value, you need every single tuple in the data set or at least every single distinct tuple in the data set. So a naive strategy for uh, addressing this would be to simply sort all of your data, and then as you're going through this sorted data, eliminate uh, duplicates, and then use that to compute your count. Now, of course, that's uh, 
quite expensive. N log n for, uh, I mean, n log n is, is not necessarily all that bad, but when you're talking about uh, when you're talking about petabytes of data, this is completely impractical. So um, there, this back in the 80s, uh, a pair of uh, of chaps called Flagellet and Martin uh, developed uh, a technique that allowed us that allowed you allowed you to sort of summarize a data set in a bit vector in such a way that uh, this bit vector is going to sort of slowly fill up in a very precise way. And as it fills up, uh, we can track how, how sort of full that bit vector is and get a reasonable estimate uh, for how, uh, how many values are in that particular set. And we're going to use hashing as part of this in order to uh, eliminate duplicates. Now, the sort of intuition for this, uh, you can think of sort of a, a big tank of water. Now, um, that tank of water, towards the bottom, uh, if, if, there's, if there is gravity, towards the bottom, that, that tank is going to be pretty much all water. And up top, it's going to be pretty much all air. But well, especially if you're shaking it around, throwing some randomization in there, there's going to be this sort of interface in between where it's, uh, you know, there's some water, there's some air. And we're going to actually use that sort of thing to, to get a sense for how full uh, the bit vector is by, by sort of pushing, using, using sort of a, a, something analogous to gravity to basically push um, all of our bits, in this case, uh, towards the bottom of that vector. And uh, depending on how full it is, uh, that bit vector will, be, will have a certain length. So uh, we have this, this bit vector. We're going to use a couple of tricks to basically shift all of the, the ones, or as a, a large fraction of the ones, uh, over to the right. And uh, all of the zeros, conversely, will, will move over to the left. And so we're basically going to use this sort of boundary uh, where, where the ones stop to estimate uh, how many values are in the set. Okay, that's sort of the intuition. Uh, it may be a little confusing, but bear with me for a couple of slides. So um, we've already talked about hashes. And if we take the hash of some object, no. we take the hash of some object, it's going to produce uh, a number of zeros and ones. Now, we're going to define a function called row, and that row is uh, the value of that row is going to be uh, the smallest, the the smallest, the index of uh, the the lowest index of a bit in this bit vector that has something other than a zero. So in this case, for this ha this hash uh, zero zero one zero zero one blah blah blah. Uh, the first non-zero bit is in position 2, so the value of this row function is going to be 2. Is that clear? So the row hash, row is hash. So the row is based on the hash. The, the row function is the index of the first non-zero bit in the hash. So the equation row, row hash. Uh, it'll... Um, there's not necessarily. It's a nonlinear function, so it's hard to express algebraically. Um, so, it, if bit zero, is, I mean, the, the function is basically if bit zero is one, then zero. If bit one is one, then one. If bit two is one, then two. If bit three is is one, then three. Basically, this, this big switch statement, so to speak. Uh, is that okay? Uh, so, assuming that that this hash is completely random, what is the probability that this function row will be zero for a, a random object? Well, just the uh, so uh, when is when is the function zero? So when, when this bit is, is 1, right? Um, so what's the probability that that... Uh, is it dependent on anything else? No. So what's the probability that that bit will be 1? Wow. 1 half. Yep, so you have a 1 half probability of it being 0. What's the probability that that function will be uh, 1? 
Uh, F? Well, uh, does, uh, does the, so can it be, what happens if it's one and one? One by four, one by four. One by, okay. So it's a, it has a one half probability of being zero, uh, one fourth probability of being one, and in general, one over, sorry? Two to the, two to the power K, good. So in, for an arbitrary, uh, so in general, the probability that rho will, will have a value of K is one over two to the K. So now, that's, that's this rho function, and that's going to essentially define, give us sort of a sketch of a single object. And we're going, to be, we're going to combine multiple sketches together. Oh, sorry. So the sketch of a single object is basically going to be uh, 2 to the power of that. So essentially, we're going to take the first non-zero bit, and that will be the sketch of that individual object. Now we're going to take, uh, in order to compute the sketch of an entire set, we're going to, um, we're going to basically take a bitwise OR of the sketch of every individual object in the set. So if we have something with this hash, uh, then we'll, that'll be that. Uh, if we have another object, let's say it, it has a row of one, uh, the sketch of those two objects would be zero, 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 uh, one, one, zero. Okay, so as we said, every object has a one in two chance of having a value of zero. Uh, so given n items, what's the probability that um, none of them will have a row of zero? So what's the probability that, uh, that if there's one object, that object won't have a row of zero? One in uh, one and two. What, uh, what about two objects? What's the probability that it will have, uh, neither of them will have a row of zero? One by, one by did I hear four? Uh, so, and what about three objects? Hmm? One eight, yep. So it's basically the same thing. So there's um, one over two to the, one. Uh, there's a, a uh, one over, for n items, for n items, there will be a one over uh, two to the n chance. Sorry, uh, um, the the probability that the first bit will be set if there are n items is going to be one over. Uh, sorry, the probability that it will be a zero is uh, one over two to the k because all of them have to be zero uh, for that bit to be a zero. Is that? Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, one. So the, the only way that, you can, that the first bit can be zero is if all of them are zero, because we're doing bitwise forms, right? Uh, now the probability, as we said, that the first bit is, is the, sorry, each of these has a, only one thing set. Uh, so the only, the only situation where uh, all of these will be, uh, will be zeros, so there, there's a, a one and two chance that this will be a zero, one and two chance that this will be a zero. So basically for n objects, uh, this has a one over two to the n chance of being a zero. Or more likely, it has a one over uh, two to the n, one minus one over two to the n chance of being a one, which is much more likely. So even if the two sketches have uh, one, then also the larger. Uh, so, so each of the sketches um, only has one bit set. Uh, call the definition there. Uh, two to the power of row. So it's basically the uh, the sketch consists of exactly one bit. So now you have two sketches. Uh, uh, I mean, the bit of two sketches. One. I mean, the last bit. Uh, yeah. So it's entirely. Uh, so it doesn't. So if if you have one one uh, one zero, that's perfectly fine. 
uh, but the bitwise org is still going to be one. Uh, so this is so it, there's a one over two to the n chance that it will be a zero, and the only possible the only other possi possibility is that it's not a zero. So the probability has to sum up to one one minus. Okay. So what about um, what about to the k? So if so now we're talking about bits other than the first one. Zero, zero. What's the probability that this bit will be a zero? That the third bit will be So let's start with the second. What's the probability that bit one will be a zero? Uh, so just a zero. Over two to the two to the power k uh, close uh, close enough two to the power uh, k n. So basically, as as the bit increases as this goes up, uh, the probability that that will be a zero goes down. More generally, or sorry, the probability that that, that will be a zero goes up. Um, so zero is two. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, probability that this is zero is one over two to the k. Uh, two to the k. Uh, probability that all of them are zero is one over two to the k n. Um, no, sorry. The probability that it will be a one is one over two to the k. Um, ah, okay. Sorry about that. So the probability that any of these will be a one is one over two. Uh, uh, that any of these will be a 1 is 1 over 2 to the k. The probability that it will be 0 is 1 minus 1 over 2 to the k. Um, so after you, so the chance that n objects will have uh, a 0 in here is 1 minus 1 over 2 to the k to the n. Don't worry about the, the exact formulas. The, the basic intuition that I want you to get from this is that as k goes up, the probability of that bit being a zero decreases, but it also uh, in the, the probability of it being sorry the probability of it being a zero decreases as k goes up, but the probability of it being a one goes up with the number of elements in the set. So essentially, you're going to uh, you're going to have sort of lots of ones towards the lower order bits and lots of zeros towards the higher order bits. And where that, that interface occurs is going to slide uh, with respect to um, the, is going to the number of elements in the set. And in particular, because the number of elements in the set appears as a logarithm, it's actually going to slide, uh, sorry, is an exponent, uh, the, the sort of position in this list is going to slide with uh, the, the, the sort of interface between the zeros and the ones is going to slide with respect to the logarithm of the number of items in the set. So to be precise, uh, if we if we sort of identify the first non-zero, sorry, we identify the first zero bit in the sketch, uh, the the position of that first zero bit in the sketch of the entire set is going to be uh, proportional uh, to the logarithm of the set. We're going to have some scaling factor that basically accounts for that, that proportionality. Um, the scaling, this is the scaling factor. Uh, more, the, the, the math behind it is, is kind of tricky, and if I'm not mistaken, the uh, authors actually just kind of pulled that out experimentally. So, long story short, 
that's the scaling factor, and the idea is basically that the, the position of this element is going to be, uh, the expectation of that position is going to scale logarithmically with the size of the set. And we can do a little bit of uh, basic arithmetic and say that if the expectation of that position uh, scales with uh, respect to the size of the set, uh, well, we can, if we know that position, we know the, the, uh, the, first, the position of the first non-zero bit, we can determine the expectation of the set, uh, sorry, the expectation of the size of the set in terms of that position. So uh, essentially what we do is just invert the exponent and uh, invert the exponent and we end up with a, uh, an estimate for the size of the set. The first position of the zero, mm -hmm. the non-zero. The first position, uh, the lowest bit that has a zero in it. Okay, how are we doing on time? Okay, so, um, right. So essentially, you can scan through the set, get uh, compute the row of each element in the set, and then get bit, do a bitwise or of all of these values, and get an estimate of basically how big the set is. Now, the, the sort of downside to this is that that estimate is going to have a fairly high variance. And in particular, they note, I believe it's about a 1.2 orders of magnitude. Uh, R itself has a, a, um, a variance of 1.2, which essentially gives you about uh, a power, uh, a little over a power of two. Um, makes your estimates of the, the count about a power of two off, which is not ideal. So what we can do uh, to, to reduce that uh, variance is to actually do multiple sketches at the same time. Uh, use a slightly different hash function each time through and get basically slightly different results um, and basically combine all of these multiple sketches together uh, using either average or, or median, and basically pick the uh, average or median value of all of the estimated counts. So uh, here, here's a bit of a, a, a question. We've, we've sort of described this in terms of counts, uh, but I, I said when I went into this uh, that the goal was to do count distinct. Does this algorithm do count distinct, or does it do count? So what is the row value of, how does, how does row work? It, uh, specifically, does it, what is the, what is its output on the, this, if you give it the same object two different times? It's the same thing. What about, um, so, would, how would that produce only distinct values? So how do you compute the sketch then from the row values? Well, so the the um, so that's the that's how you compute the estimate from the sketch, but the bit vector. How do you get the bit vector? Hmm? It, okay, so you uh, you take the k uh, the k bit um, the the rowth position uh, of of everything and you do a bitwise or on all of them. So by, by doing the bitwise or, what do you get if you take the bitwise or of the sketch of two different objects? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, the same object. You get basically this, the, if you, the, the same object will never contribute multiple times uh, to a given sketch because you're, the, this row function is deterministic. Every time you, you pass it the same uh, object, you'll get back the same value, and the, the particular bit that you choose to set in the sketch is going to be uh, dependent on that row function. You can set that bit as many times as you like. You can incorporate the results uh, a, a given object into that sketch as many times as you like, uh, but it will only change the sketch. It only has any chance of changing the sketch uh, the first time it, it, um, it gets evaluated. Uh, so another question, uh, how big should you make this bit vector? 
So what, what happens if uh, it's too small? You get, you, you basically get no zeros. Um, and what happens if it's too big? Well, wasted space, pretty much. Not much else. Uh, but so essentially, you want to pick uh, the the size of the bit vector should basically be chosen to to get uh, as little wiggle room, so to speak, uh, between the the zeros and the ones. Um, and usually, the the size of the bit vector is going to be uh, somewhere proportional to uh, the logarithm of the total number of elements in the set. Usually, a bit bigger. Okay, so that's that's count distinct. Um, I'll try and give a, a tighter example of it uh, at the start of next lecture, but let's let's move on. So the other sketch we're going to talk about is uh, a data structure called count sketch, and this is targeted at something called a uh, top k count aggregate. Um, so the idea basically is is to first compute a group by count aggregate of every tuple and then uh, find the, the k group by terms that have uh, the highest corresponding counts. Another way of looking at this is, is uh, you're basically trying to find the, the most frequent items in a particular set. So this is somewhat analogous to a uh, fairly common problem in data mining. Uh, what's the meaning of group by count uh, Select a bunch of columns, comma, sum, uh, or sorry, select bunch of columns, comma, count star, group by bunch of columns. Group by count, uh, it's just a, a group by query with a count aggregate. So we are counting and we count? Hmm? Uh, yeah, uh, so you can't do top K with, with that, but um, the other way of, you could write this as a nested query. So, uh, So basically, this is this is the the general structure of the query that we're trying to uh, evaluate. And you'll note that it's uh, holistic. So you need to uh, go through this in, the entire input to this query in order to get an output. Um, now, the idea of the sketch uh, is that we're going to oh. So the other thing is that you need all of these group by terms. So if you have a large number of distinct values for the grouping terms, you need to keep track of all of them, every single one, in order to get a precise answer. Because um, you might encounter uh, something with maybe five items at the beginning, uh, five occurrences at the beginning of the set, the maximum number of occurrences of anything else is 10, uh, and then you encounter uh, six occurrences of that same item at the end of the set. So there's 11 in total, but somewhere in the middle, basically, you, do, you never know if, if a given item will occur additional times. So the idea of the sketch is to have a little bit of, of um, wiggle, so to speak. You have, uh, you get back a set of answers that are definitely in the, the result. Uh, you get a couple of answers that may be in the result. And basically, anything that is sort of close to the boundary, close to uh, being eliminated, uh, by this 
limit of k uh, might or might not actually appear in the result set. Uh, to make that a little more precise, uh, the uh, so you're asking for a particular number of elements k, and you have some uh, notion of wiggle room, we're going to call that uh, epsilon. And the idea is that, uh, or the guarantee that we're going to provide is we'll return k objects, and every single, uh, if nk is the lowest count of all of the, the top k objects in the correct result of that query, we're going to guarantee that every single object that we return has at most one minus uh, epsilon, um, is within one minus epsilon of that, that sort of correct boundary value. So there's some, some lower, uh, the, the, the smallest value that would be returned by this query, we're going to call that nk, and we're going to guarantee that every item we return uh, has at least one minus epsilon of, of nk. Um, uh, has a count. Hmm? Well, it's pretty much this. It's uh, we're, uh, the the bigger this is, uh, the more we have. So we have some number of, of values that we're going to return, right? Um, says at the count of 1,000, uh, this might have a count of 500, and uh, then 499, uh, 498. And so let's say that this query, if we executed it on this full data set, with these being the counts, that query would return a cutoff right here, uh, at four, between 499 and 498. One, two, 499 is the kth largest count of any of them uh, in this set. The idea of epsilon is that we're going to assert that anything we return is going to be at least 499 times 1 minus epsilon. We're going to return a set of values, exactly k values. But the values we return, the, we're, we're not guaranteeing that those are the top k, we're just guaranteeing that those are uh, the k values that are within uh, an arbitrary set of k values that are within uh, sorry within this this range 490 99 uh, times one minus epsilon. So we're we're basically moving the threshold down a bit and. In particular, we're, we're scaling it, the, the threshold down by 1 minus epsilon, and the, then we're going to return an arbitrary k, uh, an arbitrary selection of k elements from above the threshold. So anything that is, is much larger than, than k always gets returned, or almost always gets returned. Anything that is sort of very close to that, that boundary point may or may not be returned. That's the idea. All right, maybe it'll be a little clearer uh, in, uh, oh, actually, yeah. Um, so, same deal. The, the sort of intuition behind this is that we're going to keep precise track of exactly k entries. And or almost precise, I should say, track of the top k entries and their counts. And for everything else, we're going to build up an approximation of their counts. And it doesn't need to be necessarily a precise approximation, but it needs to be reasonably good. And so every time we get a new tuple, uh, it's either already in the top k that we're tracking, in which case we'll update that. Um, if it's in this sort of everything else category, uh, then we'll need to update that approximation, but we'll also need to, uh, we may decide that that tuple is now worth tracking. So we're going to take that tuple and use it to replace one of the, the k entries that we're tracking explicitly, uh, if it is appropriate to do so. Okay, so here's uh, 
this this is a little bit uh, this bit is a little bit non-intuitive. I'll, I'll try and um, make it as intuitive as possible. Um, so the count sketch is based on a, a function we're going to call s, and that s for any given object deterministically returns either plus one or minus one. You can think of this as a one-bit hash, a one-bit hash function that returns a, a minus one instead of zero. And the sketch of a set of objects is going to be the, a sum of these values. So, if I have a set that contains exactly n copies of a given object, what would this uh, sum be? N or or minus n. Right, so it'll be n or minus n, and can you figure out what uh, which of those two it'll be? Or given the object, can you figure out what which it'll be? Yes. Yeah, so it's out? Yeah, so basically the if if this is plus one it'll be plus n, if it's minus one it'll be minus n. So the expectation of this particular sketch of R is going to be n times s of the object. All right, here's the somewhat non-intuitive bit. Uh, if the set is entirely random, I pick just some arbitrary set and say, what is the expected uh, sketch value of that entirely random set? What is the expected value of this sum? Zero, exactly. Okay, now here's where things get really trippy. Um, the expect, so if we know that there are some number of object, uh, some number of instances of a given object in this set, we can look exclusively at those objects and assume that the entire rest of the set is completely random. Now, if we don't know how many object, how many instances of that object there are, we know that the sketch gives us an approximation of that object. So, um, we have uh, the expect um, so given given a set with n object with n instances of, of uh, this object and so I guess let, let me rephrase this in this way uh, what happens if we have an object uh, a set containing precisely n instances of a given object and the rest is completely random then what is the expected sum? Plus, plus n or minus n, exactly. So that's exactly the, the sort of intuition behind this, that we can, we can sort of zero in on this one object and guess that the, estimate, the estimated number of occurrences of that given object is going to be equal to uh, the number of instances, uh, the, basically what we would get if if that was the only object in the set, then we assume the entire rest of the set is random. That has an expected value of zero. We should have a plus zero here. But basically, we assume that, that, one that uh, there are n instances of this one object. We assume that the rest, the rest of the set is random. And what we want to do is figure out what n is. And n, in this case, is basically going to be the, the uh, value of that sketch times either plus one or minus one. That's extremely non-intuitive, and uh, strictly speaking, given, that, given those assumptions, it's correct. However, uh, this, has, this estimate has an extremely high variance. Uh, obviously, the rest of the set isn't, strictly speaking, completely random. So the, the expected count that we're going to get here is going to be way, way off from the right value. 
So, uh, what we're going to do here is exactly the same thing that we did uh, to reduce the variance in, uh, in the count distinct sketch. We're going to use many sketches. And precisely, we're going to keep, uh, we're going to pick two parameters, n and m, and we're going to keep n times m sketches. Basically a big grid of, of sketches. And for every single object, we're going to update each column. Uh, we're going to incorporate that, uh, that object's uh, contribution to the sketch into every single uh, column, but we're only going to update one row for each column. So we're going to use a hash function, uh, a different hash function for uh, each uh, column. And we're going to use that hash function to pick a particular row to update. And then we're going to update the sketch as normal by incorporating either plus one or minus one for that object into the, the value that we're keeping at that particular index. So now, uh, when we want to uh, use this sketch to approximate the, the count of that particular object, what we can do is pick out the, the rows of each of these columns that uh, that, that object matches each of them is going to give us uh, an estimate of, of the number of, uh, of instances of that object in the set. And then from all of those, we can take uh, the median to figure out, to, to get a reasonably reliable approximation of the count of that object in the set of values that we're, we're constructing. Is that clear? Probably not, but uh, I will give a. I'll I'll give some more detailed examples uh, next at the start of uh, the next lecture. Uh, anyway, the the variance the variance of this is is still fairly high, uh, but what what I want you to the, the very minimum that I want you to get out of this. Hold on, there's there's one more thing. One more thing. Uh, the the basic thing. I, I just want to tie this all back to uh, back to the the uh, top k count. Um, we're going to use that data structure to give us an approximation of every single count. And we're going to keep track of, of that data structure for every single object in the set. Now we're going to keep k entries at the very top, the, the, the current list of top k entries, uh, and we're going to keep track of an explicit count for each of them. Every time we get a new object, and we need to incorporate it into this sketch, we're going to check to see if that tuple is already in the top k. If so, we're going to update it. And if not, we're going to figure out whether the expectation, the expected count based on this approximation, uh, plus the tuple that we just added, uh, is, is bigger than the smallest uh, entry in this list that we're tracking explicitly. And if it is, then we're going to move it into that list. Basically, the, the lowest track tuple is going to go away, and we're going to initiate, uh, initialize the count of that element uh, to the uh, approximation that we got from this. Now, that's not precisely correct, but it's, it turns out to be actually uh, quite reliable. So, uh, anyway, uh, sketches are good techniques for, for uh, summarizing large data sets, and Depend, you can come up with a whole bunch of very clever ways of getting approximate, using uh, sketching techniques uh, to come up with an approximation of some fairly complex aggregate values. Um, and specifically, the, what we've talked about has been two papers, one called Probabilistic Counting Algorithms and one called Finding Frequent Items in Data Streams. Uh, those are posted on Piazza. And I'll give some, some clearer examples with, uh, at the start of next lecture. All right.